paramount concern is that MPs no longer can speak their conscience, they cannot differ from their parties, they cannot vote differently, and as a result of which, they are forced to toe a line of abject loyalty, even when their conscience, in all honesty, dictates otherwise. Do you believe that this is something that needs to be changed? If MPs can't honestly voice their opinion in Parliament for fear of being thrown out, what's the point of having a Parliament? Now, I happen to agree with you on that, and I've said so before. Um, I think the anti-defection law was brought with the best of intentions. And I remember as a young man living abroad, though, uh, applauding it when I first read about it, because we were all disgusted by the ayaram gayaram politics of people switching parties opportunistically for governmental office. Uh, but the fact is that uh, the unintended consequence of this is that the law was made more and more draconian over time. So that now, not just dissenting from your party on anything, but even a failure to vote as the party wishes on any bill can attract disqualification, not from the party, which makes sense, but from the parliament. So somebody who's taken an enormous amount of time and effort uh, to get elected, uh, and who has, let's say, 10 issues he cares about, is not going to let one of those terminate his career. So he's going to end up biting his tongue and not saying something or not expressing his own wishes. I mean, we saw this already in the last parliament. The, the amusing spectacle of Shatrugan Sinha, for example, who daily spoke against Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah and his party, but dutifully voted as they instructed him to on every bill that came before the parliament because a negative vote could have attracted disqualification. Now, this is the kind of situation we are seeing as a result of anti-defection law. I don't believe those who drafted it intended it. But it's certainly a problem. I, I've written a, a lengthy essay in Open Magazine, which all of you interested can find on Google, where I talked about the crisis of representation in our democracy. And what I meant by that, I start off, in fact, with this whole proposition, is that the whole Burkean concept, that when you elect an MP, you are essentially then trusting his or her judgment to speak his or her own mind and to vote according to his or her own conscience for the next five years. If you don't like what he does or she does, you then simply knock them out in the next election. That's the entire concept of representation enshrined in the British parliamentary system. That's why even today we see British MPs voting against their party uh, and the worst that can be done to them is to be kicked out of their party, not out of parliament. But in India today, that option is not available. Every single bill attracts a de facto whip, which means there is no issue on which you can dissent from whatever the leadership of your party decides is the way to go. And since very many parties don't have a democratic forum within the party to actually thrash out a position before you vote, you are often confronted with a fait accompli where you march in like a sheep and are told this is the way you're going to vote and that's what you have to do. So Karan's question is totally right. It, it in many ways emasculates our democracy. Uh, if that's not the word, uh, disempowers, I think, is a more gender neutral word. Disempowers our elected representatives if they have become mere rubber stamps for their own political parties, which means that most parliamentary votes are foregone conclusions because you already know the strength of the parties in the House. And it's only when there's a hung parliament or a, a coalition government or whatever that the anti defection law ceases to make uh, the uh, outcomes of parliamentary votes predictable. One of the suggestions I made, Karan, in that article was that maybe we could try and amend the law to ensure that whips are only issued when the survival of the government is in question. So finance bills and votes of confidence, and for the rest of it, every MP is legally allowed to vote his or her conscience and speak as they wish. In practice, many Indian politicians won't do it because they don't want to incur the displeasure of their party leaders. But perhaps some might be emboldened to if they are not going to face the extinction of their parliamentary term by so doing. I want to raise one more issue to do with politics, dissent, difference, and point out through that example how different we are as a country today. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that in 1962, mm. in his inaugural speech in parliament in the Rajya Sabha, Anna Durai publicly called for secession. He publicly called for Tamil Nadu to become a separate country. Nehru was sitting in parliament as prime minister listening to him. He smiled at, one, at what Anadurai had to say and left the room because he said he's entitled to his opinion but it's not going to change a thing. If that had been said today, 
the man would have been done for sedition and before he'd finished his speech he would have been in jail. And I want to take one more example, again by the way, coincidentally from 1962, slap bang in the middle of the Chinese war, mm -hmm. when perhaps the reverses being suffered by the Indian army were at their worst. A young BJP MP Atal Bihari Vajpayee demanded a special session, not just a debate, but a special session of parliament to discuss the Chinese war and Nehru granted it, it was held and while the Indian army was defending us at the border with China, parliament was discussing the reverses it was suffering, the incompetence of the Nehru government, the failure of Indian policy. And once again, if that had occurred, as many thought it should when Pulwama and Bala could happen, Mr. Modi would have had a heart attack. And I'm putting that as bluntly as that. Why is that changed? Why aren't we and the I'll same as a, we were? And a third example to amplify the point you're making, as I agree with you. And that's also from 62, so coincidence stretched to the limit. When, uh, during this debate in the special session on the war with China, Nehru made the unfortunate statement about Aksai Chin, that he said, no, not a blade of grass grows there. Uh, to explain that India's strategic interest was limited, there was no population there, and no agriculture. And so he said, not a blade of grass grows there. Whereupon a not so young Congress MP, whose name I think was Mahadev Mishra, I'll have to look it up, stood up and said, pointing to his own bald pit, Mr. Prime Minister, not a hair grows on this head either. You're going to give it to China too. And, and, and this is his own party MP, challenging the Prime Minister, and that too is unthinkable today in any party. So we're looking at a dramatic shrinking space in our political world. All the three examples, the one I gave and the two you gave, illustrate the very point you're making, uh, that all those things would be impermissible today, and equivalent of the another I speech should be dismissed as anti-national, it'd be charged with sedition. The equivalent of the Vajpayee demand would be treated also as anti-national. In fact, we were all expected, as you know, to rally behind the flag when Pulwama and Balakot happened. And I must say that the opposition really felt it had no choice. There were many voices within some of the opposition parties saying, whose fault was Pulwama? Why were 40 coffins coming back to Indian homes? Uh, what would the Balakot achieve? Is it true, as the international media says, that we've just hit a few trees on an abandoned hillside or a deserted hillside? Uh, but these questions were never asked publicly. They didn't become issues in the campaign because people felt we really have to stand behind the armed forces, stand behind the flag when the nation is in peril. And that kind of thinking, and the, the third example, as I said, is unthinkable because nobody in politics would have the courage to question his own party leader in that way anymore. So all these three things suggest that actually in 2019, our space for dissent in politics has shrunk dramatically from 1962. You know, Shashi, one of the things that many in this room will remember is that practically whenever the Prime Minister gives an interview, he makes a point somewhere in that one hour or two hour interview of saying that he values criticism, he encourages criticism, the press have a right to criticize him, he wants the press to continually find fault and point it out with the government. But never do journalists do it. And if they do, ministers shy away and get angry, and certainly the Prime Minister doesn't want to answer questions that are critical. Practically every question put to him seems to be scripted, seems to be designed to ensure that the government and the PM are shown in the best light. So what's your advice as someone who's an author, as well as someone who's a politician, and so you, in a sense, are on both sides of this question. What's your advice to journalists when it comes to asking questions? And what's your advice to politicians when they're faced with awkward questions they don't like? But one expects them to answer. What do you say to both of them? Well, as far as the journalists are concerned, I think you saw during our um, uh, 10 years of UPA and certain during the five that I was in government, that we not only uh, expected questions to be critical, and you in particular had your notoriously forensic style of questioning, uh, but that we actually relished that because it showed that we were willing to be held accountable. And I would certainly encourage journalists to have the courage to do that, but since Karan Thapa no longer has his show on television, and Barkhadat no longer has her show on television, and Sagrika Ghosh and Rajiv Sadesai were bumped from their channel, and so on and so forth, how many journalists are going to have the courage to put their careers on the line by asking questions they know are unwelcome, A, to the people they're questioning in politics, and B, to the owners of their channels, who have other business interests besides the media, and who are therefore vulnerable to pressure 
from the um, from the government. I'm being very blunt because many of you are very young journalists uh, starting out in your careers. And, and I, I feel for you because um, some of you are just starting families. You'll soon have kids to put through school. Uh, can you afford to, to risk your job? Uh, but the problem is that uh, as long as our media is structured the way it is, that is becoming a genuine challenge for a young journalist. I've met some who are idealistic enough to quit. Uh, but at some level, they could afford to quit or they didn't care about not having an income until they found something else to do. Uh, and I've actually had one or two uh, who were instructed to badger me, for example, coming up to me and apologizing, sir, saying, sir, we had no desire to do this. We were, we were forced uh, by so-and-so, uh, the editor on our news channel or whatever, and, and, and now you know, our conscience finally rebelled. We've quit and we wanted to apologize to you. That's happened to me twice in the last few years. So I, I know that it takes moral courage and financial independence to be able to do that, and it's very, very difficult. But we've got two institutional problems that I've hinted at in my comment. The first is that journalists themselves are vulnerable, and the second is that owners are vulnerable. Because the ownership structure of the Indian media is quite unusual. We have no equivalent uh, of, of, um, of someone uh, whose only business is media, except online. There are some online sites which have managed to preserve their independent integrity and their space because they have nothing else that can be subject to tax raids and ED enforcement and God knows what else. But everybody who in any way is seen as encouraging dissent or criticism is the object of, of pressure. And as a politician, you ask, what would I say to politicians? I'd just say, you know, do as much as you can. Speak in any case, at least to the people in the room. I mean, yesterday, for example, I did a, a three-hour session in, uh, in, in Jaipur under the auspices of the All India Professionals Congress, in which um, I said an awful lot of things that were very critical of this government and the way in which this government has performed, conducted the economy, and so on. If you look at today's newspaper reports in Jaipur, not one of my criticisms have been given much space. Either things I said about the Congress party have been quoted in full, as in one of the leading English newspapers today, or comments I made that were uncritical of, or that were even mildly respectful of, the ruling party were the ones that were publicized, even if they didn't account for 5% of the total content of what I said. Is that accurate journalism? Is that what you're taught in, in your reporting classes in journalism school? Or even if you're just trainees in a publication? Surely not. But when it comes to politics, different rules apply. You don't practice your profession with the, the honesty that uh, it demands because you fear for yourselves and your own lives and your own careers. Or if you don't, you'll have an editor sitting on top who knows what's good for him in the publication and who will wield his blue pencil through things that are likely to cause offense. This is a, an unprecedented situation, India. except for the emergency, 22 months. We've never had this degree of self-censorship in the Indian media, and it's devastating for our democracy, because there is no democracy without dissent. We have a very long tradition of dissent in our culture, going back two or 3,000 years, that is now, astonishingly, proving far too easy for determined people and authority to stamp out. You know, we've talked about journalists, we've talked about politicians. I want to raise a third area of concern when it comes to this question of permitting, encouraging, tolerating dissent, and more importantly, because it's connected to it, standing up and defending our rights as citizens. And I'm talking about the, le the judiciary, I'm talking about our high courts and our supreme courts. At critical moments, it seems at the moment today our Supreme Court shies away from defending our rights. Look at the manner in which the Supreme Court, the top court in the country, repeatedly kicks down the road a petition questioning the clampdown in Jammu and Kashmir brought by the editor of the Kashmir Times. And today's Indian Express on its front page points out the 252 habeas corpus petitions at the Jammu and Kashmir High Court have not been entertained deliberately for six weeks. And by the way, that Latin phrase habeas corpus actually means bring forth the body. It is so clear to the High Court what is being required of them to do. It is so obviously their duty to insist that the government, despite its concerns, stand up for the rights of Indian citizens and yet the High Court doesn't do so. Are you dismayed, Shashi, that at these critical moments, and it's almost like the emergency, our judiciary is also not standing up to the test. Well, I'm very disappointed on this particular example that you told me that I would still like to believe 
that the one institution in our country uh, most capable of resisting this trend towards the shrinking of dissent is the judiciary, and particularly the higher judiciary. We've had a couple of very interesting rulings by the Supreme Court. The one, for example, on Section 66A, in which in the Shreya single case, the Supreme Court actually said that you, know, you cannot interpret the IT Act uh, so as to completely restrict freedom of expression on the internet. You remember people were being arrested for Facebook likes, and, and that stopped after the Supreme Court judgment. And there's been a consistent series of judgments on freedom of speech that decrees that it cannot be infringed unreasonably. Now the question is, if the High Court doesn't even consider the case, how do you get it to the Supreme Court? Because the problem is, if the High Court says, for example, that in this particular instance we cannot impose upon the government the right to produce the body or the, the people whom they've detained because it's a public security thing that's beyond court jurisdiction. For example, as a, possible, as a possible ruling, somebody could take that to the Supreme Court and say this flies in the face of all your rulings and the chances of winning in the Supreme Court would be relatively high. By then, as Karen points out, six or seven or eight weeks would have gone by and, and the poor person would have been detained pointlessly in all that time. But the truth is, that we are in this absurd position because the lower the level of the judiciary, therefore the greater the chances of future preferment, uh, the greater the pressure, it would seem, from people uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in positions of authority, or at least the perception, the perceived pressure seems to be much higher. So, yes, I worry about some of these decisions. Um, at the same time, the independence of the judiciary is worth fighting and safeguarding because ultimately they are relatively more capable of managing their own, um, uh, shall we say, their own space or autonomy uh, for decision making, which other institutions that are dependent directly on the government are not able to do. The Supreme Court still has the ability to appoint its own judges and to move up. Of course, the government can refuse to approve an appointment, but that's all it can do. Uh, uh, and, and delay an appointment, that's also all it can do, but some critical judges can still be accommodated on the bench. You've got the situation where the judiciary uh, has very predictable dates of retirement so that somebody cannot be uh, threatened with dismissal or removal uh, by the government, which people in other ostensibly independent professions can be. Uh, so there is some hope for this institution still, and I personally am not prepared uh, to give up that hope because if I do, there's nothing left. Let's widen our discussion a little at this point and let's in a sense also go one step behind the issues we are discussing and I know this will for some be a controversial question but if we are honest it's one we should ask ourselves. To what extent is the intolerance that is growing? To what extent is the shrinking space for dissent which we are discussing? a direct result of our character as people, a direct result of the sort of society we are. I'm talking of the fact that we value conformity, we cherish discipline, we revere deference to adults, we get offended when people disagree with us and there's somehow a sense of politeness that you don't disagree with your elders, you barely indicate to them that you have a different point of view. Those may be admirable qualities in terms of politeness but when you translate them into terms of their effect on freedom of speech they are impediments to speaking your mind they are certainly obstacles to outspokenness so is there a sense in which we either as individuals or as a society are to blame as well yes that's true and yet i think in some ways it's worse than it used to be so it can't be the society we are it's a society we have become that we need to point fingers at after all, there was always room for non-conformity. Going back, as I said, 3,000 years, the multiple schools of, of, of ancient philosophy that actually contested, for example, even such profound issues as the existence of God uh, and still had a legitimate space in the public discourse. Uh, we had the entire tradition of Shastra, of uh, Adi Shankara reviving Hinduism by conducting debates with Buddhist scholars, with Vaitist scholars. Uh, this, this business of debate, argumentation, Amartya Sen wrote an entire book called The Argumentative Indian to establish the proposition that we are actually an argumentative culture where dissent has had a hallowed place. We have actually become less argumentative and less prone uh, to dissent because the powerful forces of the modern state are increasingly arraigned against dissent and arraigned in favor of conformity. 
That is the problem we are facing. It's, it's, if you have a government that actually encourages non-conformism, as say Nehru did, uh, I mean, it is, Nehru is rightly often reproached for not having abolished the sedition law, which he actually disliked. But it's also true that he hardly ever used it. And that, uh, and that the difference between having a law on the books and actually applying it uh, is the difference between the Nehru government and the present government. Where you actually have a situation where non-conformism is encouraged, dissent is given free reign, you don't feel insecure if such dissent is expressed because you feel that uh, this is part of what makes a democracy strong. Nehru also particularly wanted to instill habits of democracy and democratic culture in our society. Uh, whereas right now we have people who actually say the opposite, right? Who say, if you disagree with us, leave the country. You don't belong here. And that's being said by people who are ministers of the government of Mr. Modi. And I find that extremely difficult to accept, as you can well imagine, because it seems to me that in criticizing the government, I'm exercising my democratic right as a citizen of this country. And it's a right that I share with 1.2 billion people. But if all of them feel that by exercising that right, they're somehow disqualifying themselves uh, from effective and meaningful citizenship of this country, then what kind of democracy are we? And what kind of conformity uh, is going to be imposed upon us? And what is the price we will pay as a consequence of that conformity? To my mind, the answer is very clear. I mean, we really have to stand up and resist this increasing encroachment uh, on our space. Uh, because, uh, you know, as I said earlier, the media won't do it for us. Every individual citizen is going to have to stand up and, 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 and speak out for what he or she believes in and be prepared to risk some of the consequences uh, in some cases. Though I can't believe that the government would be able to, to squash every single dissenter in a country as large as ours. And so I think if we stand up and, and, and speak with courage, uh, we may actually be able to, to prevent the, the entire closing in of these walls upon us that the government is trying to push towards us. Do you think, Shashi, that the problem also lies in the fact that often we take offense too easily? That sometimes we, as a people, lack a funny bone? We all love telling jokes as long as someone else is the butt of them. What we can't do is laugh at ourselves. The British and the Americans have endless satirical programs on television which, just, which don't just laugh at their politicians and their rulers, they lampoon them. And that includes the Queen in England and the President in America. If we in India were to joke even good-naturedly about the Prime Minister, leave aside the President, it would be considered disrespectful, it would be considered rude, it would probably be considered sedition, and worse still, very few would find it funny. So I come back, do we take offense too easily? Do we lack the capacity to laugh at ourselves? Increasingly so. In fact, I think we all know that we are the only country probably where cartoonists have actually been detained for, uh, for cartoons that have actually been um, taken offense to by powerful politicians. It's an awful situation uh, where um, it's not that Indians don't have a funny bone, but as you say, uh, the funny bone only applies when there's no political consequences to laughing. Our poor Sardarji community uh, knows that Indians think they have a funny bone because of the large number of Sardarji jokes that go around, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But the fact is that um, when you really think objectively about jokes uh, on politicians, there's some of them going around WhatsApp, and they're often a good barometer of the increasing level of frustration with the government. But when the government was riding high, all powerful and widely admired, you didn't see any of those jokes against any of the leaders in the, in the government. And that perhaps is, is a sign too. Uh, I would agree with you that we are a fairly humorless polity. Mahatma Gandhi had a sense of humor. I think many of you know about a f two or three of his famous jokes that, uh, that uh, elicited laughter around the world when he went in his famous loincloth and bare-chested uh, to meet the King Emperor in Buckingham Palace. And Churchill made this disparaging comment about this half-naked fakir striding up the steps of Buckingham Palace to parley on equal terms with, with His Majesty, etc. All of this nastiness. Um, uh, a British journalist asked him, do you think you were dressed appropriately, Mr. Gandhi? And Mr. Gandhi said, oh yes, I think the King had on enough clothes for the two of us. 
which I thought was the kind of thing that, you know, um, uh, Indian politicians don't do enough. He also and, and tell them about Western civilization. When he was asked by a British journalist, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he replied, I think it would be a very good idea. <laughs> which I think was a devastating put down and very funny. Whereas, I mean, I, I scoured... By the, the way, I'm interrupting, but please applaud Shashi for the fact that he imitated Gandhi's accent as well. Many would have thought Only that intonation. was rude, but he, he applaud him for that. Only intonation, not accent. Is, is accent as well. <laughs> Slightly. But anyway, I mean, uh, Nehruji, uh, I, I scoured all his works uh, because I, I, I wrote a biography of him. And I could, I hardly came across a joke. I mean, the only thing that I found funny enough was when, when he uh, reacted with undisguised culture shock to his first arrival in America. And he said to a journalist, one show, so he, well, maybe one of his letters, he said, one should never visit America for the first time. <laughs> Which I thought was, was a witty, witty remark. But you know, we have so few examples of all of this. And some of the things that pass for quips uh, in our parliament or in our political repartee would make most genuinely sort of humor-loving people squirm. So I don't really think that, um, that there's a lot of humor in our politics, and there probably hasn't been at all for since independence. But um, what's happening now is that as you come down to uh, an atmosphere of intolerance coupled with the humorlessness that Karan talks about, then that, that means uh, of skewering authority is no longer there. If you can't poke fun at authority easily and get away with it, then you can't actually win. Uh, and that people are very, very conscious of. Now we're running out of time and I want to ask two questions that are particularly pointed to Shashi, but not necessarily nasty at all. No one perhaps faces more opposition from trolls than you do. You have perhaps a 7.2 million following on Twitter. And the number of trolls that attack you every time you express an opinion, particularly if it's humorous or tongue-in-cheek, is probably as large. How do you deal with people, particularly those who didn't realize that your holy cow and cattle class comment was intended as a joke and took it as an insult? How do you deal with that? Because that's not just reflective of the humorlessness, it's also reflective of the intolerance that people won't even accept a good-natured jocular comment about something they take pride in personally. Right, well, as you, as you, since you use the word troll, let me say a lot of this is very organized trolling. I mean, there is a systematic effort by our ruling party in particular to demonize selected members of the opposition. Uh, and and uh, it's fairly effectively done. I mean, I, I, um, it took me a while to realize what was happening, and thereafter I was able to find the, uh, the uh, what's the word I want, the backbone, the nerve, to just ignore them. But initially, when all these negative comments started coming, I read them, took them very seriously, and thought these were real people who were angry with me, um, which, of course, is something no politician can live with for too long. Uh, but having said that, um, the truth today is that so much of this is organized nastiness. There are people whose line is often predictable. Very often, you'll have 50 people using the same abuse or the same charges or the same uh, doctored photographs or, or juxtaposed photographs to, to try and attack you. And after a while, you just say the hell with it. I mean, uh, I, I've seen, for example, over 10 years now, I mean, just as there was this organized campaign to convert Rahul Gandhi into people's minds as a papu, uh, uh, which was not an accurate reflection of who he really is, but they managed to caricature him, caricature him, troll him, troll him, troll him, until finally the caricature stuck in people's minds. Similarly, I'm being trolled daily as some sort of Casanova. And it, it becomes a bit silly. I mean, I, 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 I'm proud to say that I've never inflicted unwelcome attentions on any human being in my life. But, can, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt and add that if you were trolled as a Casanova in Britain, you'd be sure to win every election? <laughs> not, not in Kerala, I can tell you. So I, I know it's meant to do me damage rather than exalt me. Uh, but at the same time, frankly, you know, this is often the same people who will post photographs of Nehru's sister and niece kissing him as if Nehru was some sort of libertine. This is part of an organized campaign to discredit every figure in the Congress party. And, you know, if you start taking it seriously, you'll never go anywhere. So on some of these things, I just learned to ignore them. In any case, the volume now is so high that I can't possibly read them all. I tell people truthfully, don't try and communicate with me on Twitter because I will barely see 5% of the tweets on any particular day that are addressed to me or tag me, if that, very often less. 
and therefore it's better if you want to write to me, write to my office or whatever, the message will reach me and I'll come back to you. But don't complain that you tweeted something, some invitation to me 20 times and I never saw it because the odds of my seeing it are actually very low. That's a digression from what Karan was saying. But the point is because the volume is so high you can afford to ignore it also. And I do, I do, because I believe interactivity is a vital part of social media. I do go occasionally, uh, read some at random at the particular moment that I happen to be able to look at, often in the car between appointments, and I reply to two or three a day, just to make sure that people understand that I am not afraid of reacting or responding to criticism or answering questions or clarifying things. That's something I'm always prepared to do and I believe politicians should. Going back to Karan's very first question, I think politicians should take uncomfortable questions. That's part of our job because if we couldn't do that, we don't deserve really to claim to represent people. But having said that, at the end of the day, uh, some things which are malicious, motivated, uh, often organized in their insincerity, they deserve to be ignored. Perhaps one reason why BJP-oriented trolls take offense at pictures of Nehru's sister and Nehru's niece kissing him is because no one's ever kissed Narendra Modi in public. <laughs> so maybe, maybe to restore our freedom and our humor, would someone give the Prime Minister a friendly, a friendly peck on the cheek? I would not advise it. Many of you may remember that when Padmini Kolapure greeted Prince Charles with a friendly kiss on the cheek, three cases were filed against her for in, us insulting Indian culture. Unfortunately, done by one. Indians, the British didn't file a single case. And that's the important thing to remember. She kissed the prince, a British prince, the next heir to the throne, and no one in Britain gave a damn. My last question to Shashi, and once again I'm going to ask you a pointed question. There is probably Shashi in this parliament, no one that I know, who would stand up more publicly, speak more loudly and more forcefully in favor of our rights, in favor of freedom of speech, in favor of the ability of people to question their politicians than you. So I'm going to ask you, can you accept today that a man that your party reveres looks back to with considerable respect and honor, Rajiv Gandhi, was fundamentally and totally mistaken, in fact, let's not use euphemisms, utterly wrong, when in 1988 he tried to bring a defamation bill, which would have curbed what he called criminal imputation and scurrilous writing. And he was even worse, even worse, when two years earlier, he tried to bring an Indian post office amendment bill which would have given the government the right to censor personal letters, letters that you and I write to each other. Now that's Rajiv Gandhi in a Congress government with a majority of 401 doing it. Would you admit that that was terribly wrong? On the postal bill, yes, I, I, I think it was a big mistake and I'm glad the government did not go ahead with it. Uh, and had they gone forgive ahead me, forgive it, me, I'm interrupting. The government wanted to go ahead with it, the president sat on it till in fact the term of government ended. Indeed, but also had it been signed by the president, I'm convinced it would have been found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So it was a bad idea. But on the first one, criminal defamation, I must say I find myself torn. I am uh, one of you in many ways. I. I as a student, I was a freelance journalist. Proud to say I won a, a Young Journalist Award at the age of 20 without ever being a full-time journalist. I'd published just enough to qualify for consideration for that award. Uh, uh, but I, I really share your profession. Uh, my, father, my father was in the newspapers but on the wrong side of the fence. He was in uh, the management side of the statesman. But I, as a result, uh, ended up imbibing. Uh, a great deal of, of, of newspaper lore and newspaper practices and I wrote extensively from my childhood in pretty much every print publication in India in the English language in the 60s and early 70s. So I, I feel a certain affinity for the media and I was instinctively against anything that would curb, for example, uh, your right to take the risk of offending somebody through what could have been considered defamation. But having seen how our media how irresponsible it can be when it believes it has a license from the ruling party to go after people in the most defamatory way. I mean, I think you know what I'm talking about in my own case. I have been as much as openly accused of murder and assault, uh, acts of which I consider myself incapable. But the fact is that I have been accused of this repeatedly 
by a malicious television channel uh, and, and, and indeed by an opportunist politician who appears on it, but that's another matter. And this has happened purely because of the impunity uh, that he believes he enjoys from our judicial system. So I have finally sued him for defamation. And quite predictably, as I was warned by well-meaning friends, the case has barely moved an inch in the two years since it was filed. And that's the other reason. There is really so little by way of judicial remedy when you are trashed, accused, and, 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 and falsely maligned with lies. I mean, it's not even false theories, but actually fake facts being invented in order to malign you and broadcast on national television by a channel in this particular case that uh, has, has enjoyed the status being number one in India. And I ask myself, what remedy is there for innocent people against this overweening power available to pro-government media? And the short answer is there is no remedy but the courts. Now it turns out the courts are not much of a remedy if it takes two years for the case to even begin to hear uh, uh, the substance of it. But the truth of the matter nonetheless is that in our country the only resort an innocent citizen has to being maligned and defamed would have to be a law that protects his or her rights. Uh, so though I am very much in your camp on most issues and certainly on the principle of freedom of speech, the line has to be drawn somewhere. Just as, you know, the old American uh, judge's statement applies that, you know, your freedom of speech uh, does not extend to the right to shout fire in a crowded theater. Similarly, I think I would argue that your right to wave your hand stops just short of my nose. You are not going to be able to say that your freedom of speech entitles you to make up false stories in order to malign people you don't like for political or other reasons. And to my mind, that is where the law has to step in. Just as free speech will not allow you to make hate speech, will not allow you to incite violence or start a riot, why should free speech allow you to defame innocent people? And I think that's something that uh, uh, makes me hesitate in endorsing your concern about restrictive laws. I have not seen the text of that particular law but some sort of defamation law, uh, criminal defamation law, I think is necessary in a country where such irresponsibility, motivated and malicious as it is, has been allowed to flourish uh, as recently as the last few years. And there, ladies and gentlemen, sadly, we come to the end of this morning's first session. Shashi has been an absolute star, so would you give him a huge round of applause? Do we have any questions from the audience? You, ha you have to rush off to a flight. Take care. If you have any questions, I've got another couple of minutes uh, because I'm not catching a flight just yet. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Karan. Just, just please. Uh, Mr. Rajiv, GM Fairmont and Mr. Varun. Yeah, go ahead. And then the gentleman in green there is standing also. Okay, Sasuji, good morning. Thank good you. Morning. So you talked about, you know, citizen have to sinking space of dissent. So I want to talk about some fundamental dissent I got about the democracy. First of all, you talk about democracy, but there is no democracy within the Congress or the BJP. Because the, all the nominations for MPs or MLAs, they are decided at Delhi, not from the ground up, bottom up. So, if there is no democracy within the democratic electoral major parties, I as an ordinary citizen don't expect them to be democratically governing the country, number one. Number two, democracy, I think in India, we only have democracy, election only democracy. For five years we elect and then we forget. That's it. The MPs and MLAs and ministers and they, they forget about citizens. They go only visit during election and the people, ministers or executives or collectors, or, they don't even cut, take telephone. They person, don't please. meet citizens and we, we don't, don't talk. So my take is that we only have five election only democracy and there is no democracy within the parties so we as an ordinary citizen and you know we, we can't expect and we have to raise some voice that's why I'm raising my voice to uh, encourage the dissent. Thank, Thank you, you sir but you know while I agree with some of your diagnosis my point is precisely that these are wrong things we ought to want to change them so I have certainly spoken in favor of inner party elections within my party I have done so publicly as well recently and I've done so privately in the past. 
I believe that you're right. We should have more internal democracy. In my own party, we do have a system of getting names from the grassroots before Delhi decides, but you're right that ultimately Delhi decides. The High Command decides, but it gets two or three names for each constituency from the local uh, party uh, leaders who take into account the local sentiment. On your second point, it's been a permanent concern of mine, which I've expressed many times in writing and in my speeches, that democracy is not an event every five years. It is a process. And that process needs to be strengthened. Every one of us who is elected has to be accountable to you between those two elections. We are not only accountable when you vote for us. You have the right to ask us questions. I get, without exaggerating, about 200, 250 emails a week from my constituents, emails, messages, SMSs, and visits with letters, questioning certain things, asking for clarifications, of course, asking for help. And I believe it's my duty to respond to every single one of them, and I do. The fact is that in our case, um, a lot depends on the individual MP. You're right, there are MPs who once they're elected, forget about their constituency, and then next five, after five years, they go to some other constituency. They don't feel that sense of loyalty. But there are many others who work very hard and who really uh, uh, understand that between elections, you have an obligation to pursue social service. So you're saying something which is worrying, but at the same time, you must understand these are things we must fight to change, and democracy gives us the means to be able to change it. I think that young man in a green shirt has been standing for a while. Be, be uh, precise. Sorry? Yeah, go ahead. Tell me who you are, yeah. by the way. I should have asked the gentleman. Yeah. So, good morning, sir. My name is Ishan Fosdar, and I'm from Christ University, Bangalore. So, okay. I, yeah. so sir, the present regime uh, brought the GST in July 1st, 2017, and right when the disastrous implement implementation of the plan struck the nation, the Doklam issue came up. Today, right after the dict dictatorial decision of abrogating Article 370, Ram Mandir is again on the hype. Accompanied by NRC and the cherry on the top, the forceful impl implementation of Hindi as the national language. So, what is the opposition doing to rebut this brilliant strategy of veiling? Yeah. So, so, what is the opposition doing to rebut this brilliant strategy of the regime of veiling true information with the dream of Ache Din and uh, national religious appeal? It's a very good question and partly should be addressed to the journalists in this room who I am told are a majority of the people in this room uh, because they are the ones who set the agenda. They are the ones who decide what is really the more important news. And so when we talk in the opposition about the fact that unemployment is at a 45-year high, that agricultural sector distress is so high that farmers are committing suicide in record numbers, such high numbers that the government is trying to suppress the numbers, that exports are down, that the industrial index of industrial production is down, that the merchandise output is down, that essentially nothing is going right in the economy. Even the foreign investment to which the government boasted is now being pulled out in spades with something like 5.8 billion having left the country in the five months since the Modi government came back to power. Indians who could invest in our economy are instead leaving the country. And we've had $23,000 millionaires migrating out of India and becoming NRIs, moving their companies to Dubai and Singapore and so on. What is happening to our country economically is something that every Indian ought to be concerned about. But you're quite right. The media's front page headlines are on three issues you mentioned and not on the economic issues we're highlighting. To me, the only answer for a political party is to take the issue to the streets. If the media will not help you set the agenda, let the people set the agenda. Have your dharnas, have your demonstrations, hold your rallies, tell people this is the time to protest because you're the ones who are suffering. And that is something that parties will have to do more and more. As a, as a sort of professional, sort of urban, middle class, educated person like many of those in this room, uh, I too don't like disruption, I don't like noise in the streets. I would like to see our democracy function the way it should. But the fact is, if it's not, I think we have no choice but to now get the message out uh, right into the eyes and ears of the public. And that's something we have to do. Last yes, two lady, questions, yeah. please. Oh, sorry, Last got the mic. two questions, please. Oh, the mic's already with that gentleman. Maybe the lady could have the next one. And then Avinash will have to tell me when I have to stop. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Avinash Puroit. On a, on a lighter note, are you aware of the trolls and messages about your English on social media? Sorry, yeah. I'm not hearing you at all. Can you hold the mic a little lower but close to your mouth? I am yeah. Dr. Avinash Puroit. Much better. Uh, are you aware of the trolls and messages about your English on social media? And how do you react to it? <laughs> 
Well, look, I mean, initially, I must admit, uh, I was a bit taken aback because I've always believed that the purpose of communication is to reach out to people. That means you've got to be understood. So if you're using words that no one understands, and obviously you're failing to communicate, and that's no good. But since I realized that some of it was a bit exaggerated, because 99% uh, are words which are apparent, their meanings are apparent in the context of the overall sentence that I'm speaking, and therefore I don't think people have found it so hard. And my publishers would say to me, if you were that difficult to understand, your books wouldn't all be bestsellers, so don't worry. And my books indeed are being read by lots of people uh, who clearly appreciate what I'm trying to do. But I will agree with you that when this got very... Uh, heavily into trolling on social media, I began to enjoy the joke. Because the fact is that, uh, you know, uh, either you live with it or you keep complaining about it. I'm not a complaining type, so I prefer to live with it and relish it. And sometimes I tell it to my advantage. For example, all this business had started uh, about a year before I published my book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister. And my publishers asked me, would you announce on social media that you're publishing this book? And I thought if I just announce this in the normal way, forget some attention, but how much attention will it get? I said, let me use a word that people can't ignore and that will start the whole focus on the book. And my tactic turned out to be right. I wrote uh, my new book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, is more than just a 500-page exercise in floxinosi nihilipilification. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that was a word that we learned almost as a joke in college, you know, that um, it's one of the longest words in the English dictionary, and it means the act of estimating someone or something as worthless. So I'm saying the book is not just estimating the PM as worthless, read it because there's more to it than that. And that is what the message was. Obviously, searches for that word spiked. Little children were taught by their parents to mug up that word for six months. I kept having people printing, producing four-year-olds and five-year-olds before me to get them to say floxinos even hear the vilification to me. But the fact is that nonetheless, it was a fun thing and it worked to my. And then I've been able to twist that tool in little ways. For example, when a certain chief minister <coughs> who had been elected by campaigning against the BJP and was in coalition with us, suddenly abandoned us, resigned and joined the BJP that he had attacked. I simply said, word of the day, Snolly Goster, first used 1845 in the US, meaning a shrewd, unprincipled politician motivated only by self-interest. Latest use today, and I didn't name the person, I didn't name the state, I didn't name everyone knew exactly who I was referring to. So that kind of thing becomes the <coughs> deliberate employment of a tactic that people were laughing at me about to enable me to score points politically and in other ways. And that's, that's something I'm happy to do once in a while. Sometimes it can get a bit exasperating. I'm, I'm often finding myself in, before audiences like this, when the person sitting there will ask me some fancy words. I meet people who bring me my books for signature. Please write some unusual word. Hey, what is this here? I mean, I'm not some sort of word producing ATM. Uh, so some of this can be irritating. But uh, the truth is that for the most part, for the most part, we're okay. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm okay with it. Thank there you was very a young much. lady here, I think, no. uh, who wanted the mic. This, this uh, must be you the last question, please. Somewhere? Achai, if you've got a mic, then let her speak first. She's been waiting for it. We have not had a single female voice. Let her speak first and then you can come. And this is the last question, please. Okay. Uh, sir, I, I would want to ask, uh, what if even a journalist being a... Again, a little closer to you. I would want to ask, what if, if even in trying to be a journalist, you want to, you know, come up and uh, do objective reporting, bring out the truth in people. But again, uh, even if you get the courage to have that voice to bring out to people, but the organization which, for which you are working on, it uh, does not help you in the process throughout. So what is the medium where you can reach out to people and be the voice of India? It's a tough one. I mentioned this already in my remarks. Are you, by the way, a young journalist yourself or learning to be yeah. one? Well, but uh, in making, a journalist in making. Okay, well, look, I mean, I have to say that it is a challenge, a very, very difficult challenge. Because um, whenever you join a media organization, you're obviously subject to the hierarchy in that organization. You have to listen to your bosses, the bosses have to listen to the editors, and the editors often have to listen to the publishers. So if you write something that's truthful and accurate, but above the chain people suppress it saying it's not, in, it's not convenient for us to publish it, 
then you begin to feel frustrated. You feel, what's the point of my just doing things that are safe to write when I believe I've seen and done something? Now, there are only two choices available to you. Either you say, I can't afford not to have this job, therefore I will do as they wish and I will knuckle under. Or you say, my principles and integrity are more important to me. I'm going to quit and see if I can find a job somewhere else. Now, it won't be easy because, as I said, it's mainly only the online websites, which are not terribly lavishly financed, who are totally independent. All the print media depends on government advertising, the owners of print media, people who have other businesses that the government can send a tax raid on or an ED raid on or a CBI raid on, etc. And therefore there is a, a real trouble. And an editor started a hate tracker in a newspaper and uh, suddenly he was fired, his contract was terminated and the hate tracker disappeared from the paper. Even though he was just listing all the incidents of communal violence and communal hate in our society, that was no longer acceptable to the owners of the paper. Uh, similarly, we've had uh, journalists losing their jobs in a very prominent Hindi television channel because they carried a report critical of the government. We've seen on a more modest level, if you like, articles published that were critical of close relatives of BJP leaders disappearing overnight from the websites of mainstream publications. Literally disappearing. One day they appear in print and they're in the, in the, on the online and the next morning they're gone and no one knows why, no explanatory note, nothing. You search for the link and it says, sorry, that page doesn't exist. Now, these are all signs of the fact that people are intimidated. And you would be forgiven for saying, I am young, I need the salary, I need the job, I need the experience, I'm going to swallow my pride, swallow my integrity. Courage is something I can't afford. But I do feel that journalism, like medicine, is a cause and not just a profession. You have to be passionate. You have to believe that what you're doing is for the good of society, for the good of other human beings, and therefore doing it half-heartedly, without conviction, without integrity, would be very sad. That's the way I feel about my politics. People keep warning me, <clears throat> why are you taking these risks? Terrible things will happen to you. Look at all the cases they filed against you. And I have to say to them, listen, if I'm just going to be a rubber stamp for what's going on, why do they need me? Anybody can do that. If I am there, it's to be me and to stand up for what I believe in, what I've read, what I've studied, what I value. And that's the spirit in which I approach my politics. And I hope that you will be able, God willing, and your finances willing, and your family situation willing, I hope you'll be able to find that courage. The next session would be started at AVI uh, on first floor. Please, please be there. Thank you very much. Platform to sharing your thoughts.